What's up, you guys? How's it going? This is Brian again with Staying Strong for Marriages. Welcome back. Thanks for spending part of your day with me. I'm excited. I have a little bit of bookkeeping to do before we jump in and check out this website called Biblical Gender Roles. I had a good friend of mine who's really going through with just like a brutal, at least compared to mine, brutal, brutal uh, early stages of divorce, separation, court proceedings, child stuff, all of it. You guys, you guys are, are well aware for the most part of what I'm talking about. So we're going to be looking at some of the things that this has to share. So I went out and did my run today. So I have the endorphins and I want to give an encouragement. I did a video about running and working out. I'm working on another one. I'm trying to hit 30 pull-ups in a single set. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. It's been rough. But what I want to say is please take care of the temple. You only get one body and it goes with you everywhere you go, right? So it's just an encouragement for everyone as you're, as you're processing all that raw emotional stuff, as you're trying to figure out what to do with the extra time, as you're battling loneliness. Uh, I think it's a great, great tool. And just heads up for you guys. So we're going to be looking at us. Uh, I'm just going to be reading from the Biblical Gender Roles website. And I'll show you here, they have just some BGR basics. So they have some podcasts that you can check out and listen to for free. And then they have like a premium subscription that you can also get into. But the BGR basics, Biblical Generals basics, they have, I don't know, is that like eight that you can check out for free. And if you really like it, then you can go under listen to podcasts. And they have premium podcasts for husbands, premium for wives, for single teens, uh, teens, sorry, or single men and then teens or single women. So you can check all that out. It's all in their podcast. I'm going to do something that, I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm basically going to read this article to you and it's going to be long, but I think one of the cool things about this is, you know, I know you guys can all read these articles. I know you can go to this website, but you can listen to it in your car if I do it like this, or you can do it. I listen to a ton of stuff when I'm running. I actually changed some investing stuff, which by the way, I have another channel, Premier Study on YouTube. Check it out. Uh, I'm putting some stuff up there about accounting certifications as well as how to build a stock portfolio. If you don't know how to do that, uh, I mean, it, it could be, it's an interesting time in the market. So I'll just leave it at that. So let's jump into this article. We'll put this aside. Okay. So this is our main website, biblicalgenerals.com, uh, blah, 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 home, uh, you know, biblical quotes. It's a big site. Okay. There's like a lot of stuff. What's the gospel? It's Christian. You can do donations. What's the manosphere. So if you don't know what MGTOW is, I mean, you got to crawl out from under that rock and, and realize what's going on. This red pill stuff. A lot of people saying, look, the divorce courts are just uh, totally swayed. They're a real problem. It's, it's not a good situation. And the answer is, like I've said, uh, I mean, the reason I cover those videos on legalizing prostitution and stuff is because that's what people are saying. That's what people are saying. Hey, this is the solution. We don't they have over 8 million hits on this. Uh, and I think they started, when is, you can see here the categories, abortion, abuse, agape, love, asexuality, beauty, all kinds of stuff, learning, divorce, femininity, human rights, all kinds of topics. So it's very similar to the uh, Doll Rock site, at least in its format and layouts. And it looks like they have stuff archived going back to 2016, 2015, 2014, 2014. So 8 million hits, 2014. It's a pretty good run. I'm, I'm impressed. So I'm going to read this story to you. It's just the main one that they have on their on their page. And it's, it's not a pretty one. I'll tell you that much. But it's an interesting one. And I think it's going to get into some of this stuff as far as if you're living with a person who, you know, employs these different strategies uh, it's, I mean, it's generally going to be, this is going to be a thing for men. One of the things that I see on Facebook is it's like so many women on Facebook and there's very few guys. So I'm going to try to make a space that's a little bit more shifted 50, 50 in favor of, of guys and women equally instead of like the 90, 10 that I'm seeing out there. So this is basically going to be an article about, I mean, manipulation. What does this guy do? What do you do if my, my friend that told me about, it, he's like, what do you do if you're living with a person who, who threatens divorce, who threatens suicide, who uh, refuses sex? And that's like the, you know, tools and manipulation that they use in order to control, control you. I mean, how, how do you do it? If you're a Christian person who believes that divorce is wrong and you shouldn't do that and you want to keep your vows, uh, what are the strategies, what are the tactics? And so this is something at least you, you can go and think about. So this writer writes in, it says, biblical gender roles. I've been reading your article for about two years now. I've been married to my wife over 16 years and we have children together, our oldest of which is a teenager. My background includes being raised in the church and my father was a pastor. For the first 14 years of our marriage, I pretty much went along with whatever my wife wanted with a few times where I went against what she wanted. And now let me share what my wife did on the occasions when I did something she was opposed to. She fought me over career moves that I deemed were necessary. She didn't work at all, and so I was the main and only provider. When we did move away every day, she would just complain about being there and tell me to take her home. Every day, he writes. After a year and a half of hearing it, I finally did. 
It cost me tens of thousands in moving fees and lost wages. I've tried to reason with her in several different ways, but she simply would not hear it. It was her way or no way. At times I even withdrew myself and gave her the silent treatment, which you have recently wrote on. And she was not having that either. Her response to my silent treatment towards her was to literally go nuts and start throwing things around the house. On one specific occasion when I refused to speak to her, she literally, and I mean literally, as in the sense it is supposed to be used, not metaphorically, <laughs> destroyed the house. Pulled down shelves, ripped up books. When that didn't work, she attacked me. I mean physically. I ended up calling the police after I couldn't take it, and I could feel that I was starting to get angry. She got in her car and drove away before they got there, and they did nothing but laughed at me. If it were the other way around, I'd have been hauled off in handcuffs. He writes, That isn't the only time, but the time I called the police, which only taught me not to, since they'll do nothing. And then, of course, there are the problems we have had with sex over most of our 16-year marriage. At one point, we only had sex eight times over 15 months. She's told me on several occasions that she had to feel connected before having sex, and I don't just get to quote-unquote use her body for sex when I feel like it. I responded to her opposition to me, wanting to quote-unquote use her body for sex, with the fact that she has no problem at all using my body to provide food, housing, shelter, clothes, entertainment, etc. She complained that I'm not verbal enough, or I didn't leave notes telling her how great she is enough, and not meeting her quote-unquote love language. And I point to other things I do, like I never miss a payment on a bill, don't cheat, drink, do drugs, beat her, protect her from any threats, and it still isn't good enough. So my wife has told me that I just need to change my communication style and how I hear her. She says that God intends for marriage to be consensual and loving, and that we should want to please each other and do things not from duty, but because we want to do them. Of course, when she says, quote unquote, loving, she does not mean the biblical definition of love, but rather love that comes from feelings and emotions. So in other words, she is saying that God intends for marriage to be based on feelings and consent and not on duty. I tried in vain to find a verse in the Bible that states what she has said to me about marriage. So over many years, I've just accepted that this would be my life with her. For the most part, aside from completely changing my personality for her, I would do whatever she wanted. I worked where she wanted me to, did what she wanted with the kids, let her buy what she wanted, and of course had sex when she wanted, which was far less than what I wanted. Then about two years ago, my wife had said she wanted to be more devout. I took it as a sign that she wanted to, you know, actually obey what the Bible said. So I started to actually read what the text of scripture says in regard to marriage and husbands and wives, and I really dug deep into it and found that there were indeed specific roles given and there were reasons for those roles. I had googled uh, quote unquote biblical gender roles in the sense of what does the Bible say about gender roles because I was looking for more information when it sent me to your site which I would read alone or away from my wife. It clarified and articulated what I was trying to tell her. Eventually found out that I was reading your site and it caused nothing but a conflict about how disgusting and horrible the material is, which is straight from the Bible. This is when it all went south and all hell broke loose. <laughs> so we went and sometimes still go to the same pasture and his wife for counseling. This is really a sweet couple that really does care about people. Yet the pastor's wife once told me that I was unloving and gave an example from 1 Corinthians 13. I told her that those were beautiful words indeed. And the guy who wrote them six chapters earlier said the wife's body doesn't belong to her but to her husband as I tried telling them over and over, my wife included, and I quoted scripture verbatim. But they will not hear it. Another guy who's, who's training for the ministry told me flatly that, quote, I was not, quote unquote, wrong. I was not wrong regarding what the Bible says about gender roles and the way marriage should be. And then he followed up with, quote, but would you rather be in a relationship or be right? <laughs> Thanks, dude. So I caught her with credit cards that she opened without my knowledge and confronted her on those. She refused to even tell me what she spent the money on and continues to refuse to this day. The pastor advised that I just forgive and let it go. And then I wrote a check for the credit card accounts. I don't know if that was the best option, but in trying to quote unquote work on the relationship, I did it to try and move forward. You see, it isn't just people on the political left that don't believe. It is the so-called Christians. I call them Chino. Christians in name only. 
that don't believe. They swear up and down that they love Jesus and the Bible is God's word. And then when I pointed out what they say is like, I'm the heretic speaking blasphemy and was the devil himself. This includes the pastor who I am friends with and care about. I once heard the pastor tell a group I was in that he was his wife's quote unquote helpmate. Helpmate. I literally spoke up and said that it does not say that. It says the reverse, and I can read it to you in Hebrew if you have any questions. <laughs> it was not well received. The pastor, a conservative evangelical pastor, who if you ask him, he would swear up and down the Bible is the word of God, won't stand up for what their very own scripture actually says. They allow women to preach and teach. Why would they even bother to tell a wife she has to submit to her husband in anything, in caps? So... These people are quote unquote devout evangelicals. They aren't leftists or socialists or liberals. They aren't rabid atheists or raging feminists. They say they believe in the Bible. They're liars. But that changes nothing. And the Bible, my wife doesn't believe a word of it based on her actions to the contrary of everything it says about marriage. Interesting story, this guy here. Let's see what happens next. Ooh, he says, I sought out a divorce attorney to see what my options were. We did the math together, I would literally end up homeless sleeping in my work vehicle. I couldn't even afford to rent a studio apartment after the state has taken everything. See, in the state where I live, they will give her half of everything. I worked our whole marriage to provide for her. I've protected her, I've loved her, given her children. She only started working the last year and a half. I would lose my children because the state would automatically award custody for no reason rather than she is a female. She would be entitled to alimony payments, child support, and she would get the house. So, I've gone back to the way things were before I tried to actually apply the Bible to our marriage two years ago because I'm left with no other resource and there is no help coming. Fellas, you know, I'd be remiss to say that no one out there is in this dude's situation. I think there's a ton of dudes in this situation, ton of guys. Ladies know about it. Church ladies know about it. Church pastors know about it. Church counselors know about it. What are you going to do? Well, my friend says that this is something that he has found helped him give him some resolve about how to go through everything, approach everything, the mindset that he should have as a Christian man. So what does he go on to say this gentleman? He says, I ground my teeth, curse your false shepherds, and pray that Ragnarok come and wipe all of this out. Then I smile and do whatever she asks. If she wants to go on vacation, we go. If she wants something, she gets it. If she wants sex, it happens when she allows it. It's all backwards and reverse. Recently, she told me that, quote, we wasted the last couple of years fighting, to which I thought, but dare not say, uh, you wasted the last couple of years rebelling. She once told me, F off. <laughs> I will never submit to you. This is from a woman who has a Bible degree, went to Bible college, attended evangelical Bible-believing churches almost all of her life. And yet, I still go to our church only because if I don't, she will rage and it will adversely affect our children. Now, all my smiling and whatever aside, you know, I don't want this to be a channel where you guys come and you listen to these stories and you look at these things and it's like a huge massive downer because already you're in the midst of tough stuff. So I try to bring a light effect. I try to, you know, I mean, approach it in the most optimistic way possible, right? Because I already know that the reality of the thing is nightmarish. And so, I mean, I'm just trying to, don't take it in, in some disrespectful or some lighthearted way that, that this isn't a big deal or it's not commonplace i know it's commonplace so this guy is pretty much at the is wits end i mean he has tried what he thought would work and and he's he's picking i mean he's basically in catch 22 he's picking the least worst option so he goes on he says and believe it or not despite all these things that i've just told you about i still do love her and we have really great kids together now i know that there's also guys out there that you know, like this guy, he thought he was getting a, a Christian wife or ladies, you thought you were getting a Christian husband. You met him at church. You met him at Bible study. They, you know, read the Bible sometimes. They involved themselves in Christian activities. And so you thought, well, golly, I would still like to cash in on, on what I thought I was getting originally. You know, I still would like to see God move in their heart. I'd still like to be involved in a, in a, a happy Christian marriage where God is the center, where we do things God's ways, where, you know, uh, Christian, I mean, what else do I have to say? He goes on, he says, so I'm not sure what the answer is. I've only seen a society that favors women. I have long thought of writing you on these points and finally brought myself to do so. He says, perhaps there's a lesson in there for others and for other husbands and wives. 
and the state of the conservative church. He says, Mark. So the author, or the host of the website, he says, so why, why pu publish such a sad story? You know, why do that? Well, lately I've been absolutely flooded with emails from MGTOWs. These are men going their own way. Guys that are like, nah, forget, forget this marriage thing. It's a rigged game. You know, the divorce courts are awful. We know what go what's going on. We watched our dads. We watched our older brothers. We, we you know, we have the internet. We know what's, what's going to happen here. You know, we, we're advocating, you know, these guys, they're advocating for sex dolls and prostitutes and one night stands inside chicks and porn and, you know, whatever. So this dude, you know, he's like, he gets all these emails from these big towels, men going their own way. Stories like the one I, from Mark feed right into their relief of why the modern feminized form of marriage is so bad for men. You know, it would have been easier not to publish this man's story knowing the MGTOW reaction it would get. Because I'm sure I will get many MGTOWs writing me saying, quote, yeah, there's a lesson there. And the lesson is men should not get married. The Christian feminist reading Mark's story will come away with another lesson. In their view, Mark just needs to go back to where he was before he discovered what the Bible says about the roles of husbands and wives. He needs to just do what the wife said and work on his, quote, unquote, communication style and, quote, unquote, hear her better. And of course, his wife mentioned the Christian feminist and humanist favorite word, which is consent. And when all else fails, Mark should just fall back into the appeasement mode with his wife because after all, quote unquote, happy wife equals happy life, right? Here's my card. This is my ideas on happy wife, happy life brought to you from the Baptist, Desiring God. You can see two of their authors take different sides on the happy wife, happy life quote-unquote Christian philosophy. He goes on, but despite the predictable reactions I knew would come from the Christian feminists on my left flank and the MGTOWs on my right flank, I really felt the Lord leading me to publish this man's story, and he is right that there are lessons that can be learned from his story, not just for other men, but for Mark himself. Before I get into the lessons that can be learned, as well as the advice in dealing with this kind of marital situation Mark faces, I want to make a few things crystal clear. First, the philosophies of MGTOW on the right and Christian feminism on the left are unbiblical philosophies. See my previous articles here, Was Jesus Christ a Feminist? and Why MGTOW is an Unbiblical Philosophy. Also, in regard to the false humanist philosophy of quote-unquote consent, please see my previous article, It's Not a Woman's Consent That Matters, It Is God's. Now, with that being said, let's first tackle some lessons that can be learned from Mark's story, and then I'll give some advice based on biblical principles for a husband dealing with a contentious and angry wife. So, then he moves into the lessons. Lesson number one, we must continue to speak out against error in our church and in our homes. What Mark did in challenging his pastors and teachers at his church, as well as his wife in his own home, is exactly what we as Christian husbands are called to do as seen in the scriptures below. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, along with all the suffering and doctrine. From the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. This is Second Timothy 4, 2-4, through 4, King James Version. So they're going to basically get people that will tell them what they want to hear. And they're going to go away from the truth. And as guys, he's saying, you know, if you're a husband or you're a man, this is this is your calling. God put this on you to stand up. Don't be a wuss. Stand up and speak out when you see and you know better. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be like Adam in the garden. Speak up. So I know that Mark is feeling discouraged after doing just what this passage commands and not seeing the results he expected. But it's not the results that matter, but only our obedience to God's commands. God is the only one who can truly change the hearts of men and women. We are only his messengers. Lesson number two, while preaching against error, we must not add to the gospel. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of a stature of the fullness of Christ. So people have different roles. And he goes on, he says, this is why we have different Christian denominations. This is why even within each Christian denomination, we have opposing schools of thought on many different doctrines, whether it is the uh, interpretation issue or the applications of such doctrines. 
He says, this is why we have different Christian denominations. This is why even within each Christian denomination, we have opposing schools of thought on many different doctrines, whether it is the interpretation or the application of such doctrines. So there are two extremes. One is to say, unless you agree with me on every doctrinal interpretation and application of the Bible, then you're not saved. <laughs> and you have no business calling yourself a Christian. The other extreme is to say, no one knows what is right or wrong, and no Christian should ever teach that other Christians' behavior or interpretation or applications of the Bible is wrong. We as Bible-believing Christians can and should call out unchristian behavior and false interpretations of the Bible by other people who call themselves Christians, and we can do so without questioning their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So we can rightly and vehemently condemn the false prophecies of Christian feminism and MGTOW without saying Christians who believe in these philosophies could not possibly be Christians. This is a very important distinction that must be made. I'm going to skip ahead to lesson number three. The seeker sensitive church philosophy is not approved by God. And this brings us to the third lesson we can take from Mark's story. The seeker sensitive church is not approved by God, nor has the children that this movement has produced proven it to be wise. The seeker-sensitive church movement is based on false interpretations of scripture passages like the one below from 1 Corinthians 9, 21 and 22. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law to the weak. I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So basically what he's saying is that the seeker sensitive churches basically are forced to try to accommodate to the culture and they abandon a lot of the harder sayings of Christianity because they want to try to basically like keep it cool until people get to that farther level. So it's like get them in the door and get them in the program and then, you know, once once they're kind of in and then go ahead and teach them the real stuff, you know, disciple them and all that stuff. So they really understand the meat and the potatoes and get off the, the, the babes food, you know, stop being spiritual babes, stop needing just milk, but be able to come full and competent and somehow that they're going to make that transition. Well, he's saying a lot of people never make that transition and that the mass majority hasn't made that transition. He goes on, he says, so how should, how should Mark deal with his contentious and angry wife? He says, first and foremost, this is not just a contentious and angry wife that Mark is dealing with. This is a wife who sexually denies her husband. Now, in many cases, a contentious and angry wife is also a wife who sexually denies her husband. But this is not always the case. I know of many Christian men whose wife will give him her body, even if it is grudgingly given, the starfish sex, they call it, in order to keep him in the marriage while still maintaining her contentious and angry spirit. Why I like this article is that because I don't want to see anyone live like this. I don't want to see any wives go through their whole lives, 16, 18 years, whatever, in this situation, angry, pissed off, fighting, you know, rebellious, rebelling against God, can't figure it out. Well, how many churches are going to give it to you like this? So either you're pissed and you're already gone, or you're pissed, you're gone, you came back, and now you're trying to say, well, well I wonder if this guy, I mean, he sounds like a real real jerk a real big d but maybe maybe he's he's got something here with this christian stuff is it really is christianity really that patriarchal let's see what he has to say so i've been saying from the beginning that sexual denial in either part of the woman or the man is one of the few reasons in which god allows divorce see my previous article eight steps to confront your wife's sexual refusal and four steps to confronting your husband's sexual refusal for more on those subjects so you guys might be interested in strategies but i like this he breaks down mark what mark did and what he didn't here's the truth of the matter even if the wife is sexually denying her husband there are some men who just do not feel god wants them to divorce their wife others feel they may stay with their wife for the benefit of the children and still others are afraid to leave for fear of the financial devastation it will cause them we can see in mark's story that he seriously considered divorce from his wife but he saw the damage that it would cause to himself personally as well as to their children we can see in mark's story of 16 years of marriage and especially in the last two years that he tried the following four approaches number one directly confronting his wife by showing her from the bible she was wrong Number two, counseling sessions in which church leaders who told him he was wrong is in, in his interpretation of the Bible. Number three, the silent treatment. Number four, bomb, appeasement. And from this email, we have shown here, as well as other subsequent emails I've received from Mark, none of these approaches have worked to change his wife's behavior, nor helped her recognize the error of her way. So let's talk about his approach that he has settled back into and that is appeasement. Appeasement on the part of the husband toward his contentious and angry wife may bring peace, but it is a peace at the expense of obedience to God. God calls husbands in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 to love their wives, quote, as Christ also loved the church, end quote. And we see that 
Christ's love for his church is seen in his washing his wife's spiritual spots and wrinkles with the word of God. This concept again is seen in Christ speaking to his church when he states in Revelation 3, 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. So we can rightly say that a husband who does not rebuke and discipline his wife is a husband who is disobedient to God's command to husbands to love their wives as Christ loved his church. As a husband, like Mark, who is dealing with this kind of wife, is a perfect example of how a man must sometimes sacrifice his own happiness to do spiritual battle in his home. The easier and less painful approach in many cases is to take the path of appeasement. But this is not an option for Christian husbands. My recommendation in these cases is to use the same approach God used with his wife Israel in the Old Testament. First, he confronted her sin and rebuked her for calling her to repentance. After she utterly refused to repent, as your wife has done, then he engaged in the silent treatment towards Israel, as I wrote about earlier. And we've seen that in other passages. It's the Ezekiel passage, I'll, I'm willing to say. Mark might say, I tried that, but she went nuts. Well, let me ask you a question. If your child threw a temper fit whenever they did not get what they wanted, would it be okay for you to appease them so that they would not throw a fit? The answer is no. And the same answer goes for your wife when she throws a temper fit. When she starts doing that, leave the house. Get your keys, get in the car and leave. Go someplace and park for a couple hours and just take a nice nap in the car or go to a park and enjoy the peace. Sometimes it might be so bad that you just need to find a friend or a relative's house to stay at for the night. Remember how the Bible advises men to deal with a contentious and angry woman? It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. And I think for many people, you know, maybe you've come across that and you've thought, you know, in the beginning, like, like this friend of mine, he was saying, he's like, look, he's like, I, do I miss my wife? Am I praying for restoration? I, you know, am I, am I, am I sad and, and disappointed that all this has taken place? He's like, absolutely, a thousand percent. He's like, but hey, now I come home, there's no crazy riot going on. There's no insane stuff that's taking place. He's like, I, I, he's like, I would never done a divorce to my wife. He's like, I, I would never, never separated. Well, he, he might separate, but he said, you know, I'd never divorce her. I never do that to our kids. I never break up our family. I never disobey God. He said, but you know what? He's like, I come home. He's like, I'm not scared. He's like, I, I don't have crazy stuff going on. There's there's no threat of this or threat of that or, or whatever. There's no manipulation. He's like, I come home. He's like, I eat my dinner. I do my thing. Not bad. Now, the wilderness is lonely, but there's, there's other worse things. So, in other words, it's better to live out of your car than in a house with a contentious and angry wife. And one other thing I would like to add, you need to be very consistent in your disciplinary approach with your wife as you need to be very consistent in your disciplinary approach with your children. Consistency. That, yep, I've, I've seen that before. As I, you know, I used to work with kids that, very manipulative kids, yeah. drug addicts, post addicts in recovery stage, for prostitutes, street smart, street wise, lie, trick, manipulate. Man, they did everything. You know, they did everything and uh, they had to, you know, it was survival tactics for the most part. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't a part so much of morals uh, as much, in my opinion, as it was. They just that's what worked. They didn't know how else to survive. So that's but, yeah, you had to be very consistent with those kids. And it was hard with a with a, a large staff trying to figure out how to keep consistent rules. It was tough. So but you do have to you have to be consistent. Uh, so the approach is you, you rebuke her and if she fails to repent and she just keeps arguing with her, then walk away and engage in the silent treatment. If she becomes violent, then you leave the home for a few hours or even for the evening. This consistent behavior towards her will, will result in one of three actions on her part. And you guys have probably seen the number two, but number one, she will completely change her behavior and pray to God. You know, that's what we want to see. You know, we want to see, uh, we want to see people follow God. Or number two, she'll file for divorce, and a lot of us have seen that. Or three, she'll at least stop the raging so you won't leave. And so maybe you're, there's some people that are stuck in like those in-home prodigal situations where it's like, it's not crazy anymore like it used to be, but it's not how it should be either. So that's, and that always sounds like a tricky thing to me. I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of resources from those people. So if you ever have anything that you think is great for in-home prodigals, send it my way. I'll cover it. If she does file for divorce, I would highly recommend you speak to multiple attorneys. There are a lot of bad divorce attorneys out there. You need to find a good one. Attorneys that specialize in divorce from a man's perspective. You also need to get recordings of her raging as that will not play well in divorce for her. The need to expose wives' sexual defrauding before the church. So, anyways, 
it basically goes on talking about uh, that sexual immorality is refusing sex, withholding of sex for manipulative purposes, for selfishness, for spiritual immaturity, for, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's sexual abuse. It's, uh, you know, it's a big problem and, and people have a tough time. Ha, I told you Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet writes the following concerning Israel's unfaithfulness to her husband, which was God, you adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of me. And he breaks it down. And he says, look, there's two takeaways. One that uh, she was taking men other than her husband and two that she did not take her husband. So it's not just a, a sin of, commission it's a sin of omission you know we make uh vows as spouses to to love our spouses to uh, to give our body to them you know to, to give our our hearts to them to you know minister to them in that way so it's a big deal he goes on and on and so you guys can see like i said this is a, i mean this is a huge site you want to get into all this stuff and this is just kind of on the main page and it goes on and on and on so that's one story uh, you can i mean probably spend a lot of time on this site it does remind me of the doll rock site which i will cover in the future i hope you guys are good again if you want to donate that money in july 2020 we'll be going to help people in beirut um and i think i have someone who's going to do 600 dollars matching so um Okay, I always share, comment. If, if you don't like the video, if you do like the video, let me know what I could do better. Let me know what you think is working, why you find value in this channel, why you subscribe, why you watch. I hope you guys are good. Continue to pray for people in Syria, Beirut. Continue to think about the things that you can do if your spouse is not going to come back for 5, 10 years, maybe ever. If you are convinced that you're not free to remarry as long as they're walking the earth, that you made your vows and you're going to stick to them. Well, I mean, you can stick to your vows, but don't just sit in your room all day forever and just say, well, that's it. My life is over. That's all I can do now is just just wait for them to come home and, and hope that they get on board with what God is calling me to do. No, no, no. Come on, you guys. Let's go. Let's go out there and let's get it done. If you're on fire for God, then, then praise God. You know, you have your life. You're not first and foremost a, a husband or a wife. You know, first you belong to God. You are an individual. And then you're a husband or your wife or whatever, mother, father, etc., etc. All right, bye.